to the Mound uh, Science and Energy Museum uh, seminar series. It's Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023, and I'm Bob Bowman, your host tonight, and I'm very pleased to introduce our guest from the Czech Republic, Martin Nicola, who's a preeminent historian on the Cold War, especially what happened during the involvement of Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union. So without further ado, Martin, welcome, and we'll look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a historian and political scientist uh, living in the Czech Republic. I was born in Prague, and my uh, main area of research is the Cold War, uh, Cold War migration from communist Czechoslovakia uh, to Western countries, above all to the United States. Um, thus, I'm doing a lot of research here in America. I had the chance to uh, consult many material uh, in the presidential libraries, in um, you know, historical societies, uh, <clears throat> at the university archives, etc., etc. So uh, it is also good for me to be in touch with the local historians, with the local researchers, and to visit places like, uh, like um, your museum. Uh, and I'm looking forward to <clears throat> to um, look at the uh, exhibit downstairs <clears throat> after my talk. Uh, before we focus on the Cold War period, let me start with a very brief historical introduction. Uh, the Czechoslovak Republic, or Czechoslovakia, was created on October 28, 1918, at the very end of the World War I, uh, when the Austrian-Hungarian Empire collapsed and was replaced by a number of uh, successor um, independent states. The Republic was actually born on American soil uh, in Pittsburgh. In 1918, uh, Czech and Slovak um, uh, political emigres under the leadership of Professor Tomáš Garek Masaryk, we can see him on the picture, um, uh, who later became the first president, um, uh, signed the famous Pittsburgh Agreement, one of the founding documents of the Republic. The Czechoslovak economy in the interwar period developed along the lines of the Western capitalist model based on the institution of private property of land and uh, capital, free private enterprise, uh, the operation of an um, unrestricted market mechanism, the principle of international uh, division of labor and moderate social reform. Uh, the political system was based on a model of um, representative, multi-party, parliamentary democracy, and was strongly influenced by the French, English, and American political systems. The, I would say, second stage of uh, uh, Czechoslovak economic and political development took place between the years 1938 and 1945. After the so-called Munich Agreement, um, signed on September uh, 30th, 1938, the Nazi German um, Reich occupied the border territories with the majority of German-speaking population, and um, uh, Slovakia uh, and also the easternmost uh, part of the republic called uh, Subcarpathian Rutinia uh, declared themselves autonomous parts of the so-called um, Second Republic. But it didn't last long. On uh, March the 15th, 1939, the German army occupied uh, the Czech lands. Uh, transferring them into the so-called uh, protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. And the highly industrialized economy of the Czech lands was absorbed into the German war machine and remained an integral part of it uh, until the end of World War II. <clears throat> With the exception of uh, the region I mentioned, uh, Subcarpathian Rutinia, which became part of the Soviet Union in 1944 already, uh, the Czechoslovak Republic was reestablished at the end of World War II. Between the liber uh, liberation of the country in May 1945 uh, and the uh, uh, communist takeover in uh, February 1948, the Czechoslovak economy developed into a system which differed radically from the liberal capitalism of 1920s and 1930s. First of all, almost uh, three and a half million Germans were expelled from Czechoslovakia with the consent of the Allies and were robbed of their possessions. <coughs> The key industries, such as banks, uh, insurance companies, uh, mines, heavy industry, uh, were uh, national, uh, nationalized. And a three-phase um, land reform de facto destroyed all private property 
The post-war period was also typified by the rising power of the Communist Party and its orientation towards the Soviet Union. Um, we can ask what were the key elements of the communist success and um, the defeat of the democratic camp. The, uh, you know, until the coup in Czechoslovakia uh, in February 1948, there was a tendency to ascribe a communist success in Eastern Europe or in Eastern European countries uh, to a lack of democratic traditions and to social backwardness. Um, but the Czech coup um, in February 48 was um, or seemed to be of a different variety. Uh, as I said, Czechoslovakia was widely known for its democratic traditions um, and the minimum of social friction. Um, as I said, its uh, highly developed uh, industry was nationalized, uh, the land reform was introduced, uh, and Communist Party won the democratic election in May 1946. And all that happened without any revolution. And there were no Soviet troops on Czechoslovak territory. <clears throat> uh, so what was the reason of uh, the failure of democracy in Czechoslovakia and the establishment of the red totalitarian regime uh, lasting as in the neighboring states for more than uh, four decades? First of all, the communists came much better prepared from Moscow, where they, uh, they spent the, the war years. They learned how to penetrate all important sectors, how to occupy the crucial positions in the regional and um, uh, local governmental bodies. They learned how to work with propaganda, how to convince the people with their unlimited promises to vote for them. And after they won the election in May 1946, uh, they gained control of um, over the most <coughs> important ministries, meaning the Ministry of Defense, Interior, Information and Agriculture in the coalition government and were preparing themselves step by step uh, for the inevitable conflict uh, with their coalition partners, meaning the non-communist parties and the pro-Western politicians. <coughs> While the communists were receiving direct support and instructions on, on how to proceed from Moscow, from Stalin, the Democrats or the pro-Western politicians felt kind of internationally isolated. Both France and Great Britain had to deal with uh, their own political crisis at home and uh, the loss of their global colon uh, colonial empires and had only very limited interest in Central Europe. <coughs> uh, the United States was simply too far away and despite some moral support from the US uh, embassy in Prague, uh, the Czechoslovak Democrats simply didn't um, uh, have the strong protector uh, and friend from abroad. Some of them believed that Czechoslovakia would, thanks to its strategic position in the very heart of Europe, uh, play the role of the bridge between the West and the East, the mediator or a meeting point where imminent conflicts could be solved. But, you know, uh, these uh, naive expectations of um, our politicians, our Democrats, that uh, the country could become another Switzerland, independent, neutral, with its own foreign policy, were quickly dispersed. The communists under their leader Clement Gottwald, we can see him on the poster with uh, Stalin, who became a prime minister, um, planned uh, to seize absolute power and were just waiting uh, for the right moment. It happened to be the governmental crisis, which developed in late February 1948. Twelve uh, non-communist ministers, meaning uh, members of the government, uh, from three parties resigned in protest against the activities of communist-controlled security police. In normal cir circumstances, the president would have uh, accepted their resignations and held new elections. However, the communists um, uh, feared defeat, uh, so they rather <coughs> used threats to prevent uh, the new elections. Um, the communist-controlled labor unions also marched their supporters out uh, onto the streets of Prague and other major cities. Uh, the communists also arranged a general strike. Uh, they took control um, in um, outlying areas and basically eliminated any resistance by democratic elements and pro-Western elements uh, in the society. And then it was, it was over. Uh, the Czechoslovak democracy uh, had been defeated. The president, Edvard Beneš, decided <clears throat> not to risk a Soviet invasion or a civil war and uh, surrendered. And the Czechoslovak democratic experiment, as we can call it, uh, in the Soviet bloc was over and 41 years of oppression began. 
<clears throat> Stalin directed the Czechoslovak communists to carry out purges and the nation held the largest show trials in Eastern Europe. Over a six year period from 1949 until 1954 55, uh, the victims of these trials included uh, military leaders, uh, Catholics, Jews, uh, democratic politicians, those with some uh, war wartime connections with the West, like our. Uh, um, uh, soldiers who were fighting in Great Britain or in Western Front um, during the war, as well as high-ranking communists. Almost 180 people were executed <coughs> as a result of these, um, of these trials. Uh, farmers, especially the wealthy ones uh, referred to as the Kulaks, uh, became enemies of the new regime. And uh, during the years of, uh, we call it, Stalinization process, uh, farms were nationalized, um, uh, in what was called the collectivization in early 1950s. Uh, during the collectivization or after that, no one could own more than 120 acres of land. Uh, while the lives of richer peasants were destroyed, poor peasants uh, were eventually excited by the new system. Uh, but you know, the communists began to blackmail farmers and they threatened them with imprisonment if they did not join uh, the newly established cooperatives. <coughs> The communists also took over church property. They closed more than 200 uh, uh, monasteries in the country and they were persecuting the, the clergy. And the communist ideology permitted the politically based education system. Uh, the pupils and the students had to study subjects such as uh, Marxism Leninism. Uh, the applicants were accepted into universities and high schools uh, only if they had working class backgrounds, if they supported the communist regime and had participated in communist youth organizations. And we can easily continue. The fact is that this very long era of communist regime in Czechoslovakia had a devastating effect on the nation's soul and character. And it's visible even today, 30 years uh, after the revolution. Uh, and another important topic related to the seizure of power by the communists is the emigration, or better to say, <coughs> the exile. Because uh, from the moment of the government crisis in late uh, uh, February 48, uh, the floodgates of communist oppression opened, and the first politicians, journalists, academics uh, criticizing the methods of, uh, of the uh, communists uh, rather left Czechoslovakia before they could be imprisoned. In the search for accurate data on this, we call it post-February exile wave or post-February mi migration wave, we encounter widely varying statistics. Uh, my colleagues, historians, are still not, uh, unable to agree on the magnitude of uh, individual waves of migration uh, from Czechoslovakia in, in 20th century. Some authors work with a very rough number, and I would say an overestimated number of half a million of Czechs and Slovaks who left the country after 1948. Uh, but I would say that 250, maybe 300,000 is a more realistic um, uh, number. Even the kind of official estimate of the Czechoslovak state security at the end of 1948 um, states about 8,600 uh, people, refugees, people who illegally left the country. And for the period um, between 1948 and 1953, meaning the first five years of the communist regime, uh, the Czechoslovak state security lists a total number of 44,000 people who, who left. Uh, but in reality, we are talking about 50, maybe 60,000. Um, in late 40s, uh, it was dangerous, complicated, challenging, but not completely impossible to sneak out, just to go through the, the Iron Curtain. Because the barbed wire and the minefields uh, and uh, patrols with, with um, uh, German shepherd dogs, um, uh, they became part of, of the uh, border protection in 1950-1951. So if you uh, were lucky and uh, you just um, uh, had a good uh, guide who knew uh, the, uh, the environment, then you were able to, to sneak out and get to the uh, free world, uh, get to Bavaria, which was the American occupation zone of Germany back then. Uh, there were many ways how to, how to go through. Uh, even some of them were very you know, interesting and, and uh, um, fascinating. Uh, the people tried to use the um, balloons, um, 
they kidnapped the train, they built uh, kind of a small tank or <laughs> armed uh, vehicle. Um, all those are, are successful uh, attempts. Um, but of course many of them were just stopped by the border guards and uh, many people died on the Czechoslovak border. There were also three uh, pilots um, who were you know, heroes uh, from the War of, uh, of Britain in 1940, 1941. After the war, they became uh, civil pilots of the Czechoslovak Airlines, uh, but because of their you know, past and uh, because of their uh, wartime experience from Great Britain, um, the communists you know, were waiting for the right moment to arrest them. So very uh, soon after the communist takeover, I think it was it was May or June 1948, uh, these three colleagues, these three pilots decided to, to leave and they simply kidnapped um, uh, the airplanes they were piloting, uh, one from Prague, one from uh, Brno, which is the second largest city, and the third one from Ostrava. Uh, they all were heading to uh, no, actually, sorry, from, from Pressburg or from Bratislava. They all were heading to, to uh, Prague, but eventually they just kidnapped the machines and landed in Munich. Uh, so that was a big, you know, <laughs> a big event. Uh, the communists were furious because how could it, you know, how, how could it happen? Who would there? And based on this story, also um, a movie, kind of a political thriller uh, uh, was made in 1952. Uh, so, as I said, there were many interesting stories and uh, the people were really brave, you know, because many of them took their families, small children, and they simply uh, tried to, uh, to go through <coughs> to the free world. The first steps uh, brought them into the so-called displaced person camps in uh, Western occupation zones of Germany or Austria. <coughs> These facilities were under the uh, administration of the International Refugee Organization, one of the United Nations agency, uh, agencies based in Switzerland. And between 1947 and 1952, uh, the whole, let's say, refugee agenda in Europe was under the control of the International Refugee Organization, the IRO. In July 1948, um, uh, the organization granted the status of political refugees also to the Czechs and Slovaks with the same legal protection and benefits as other uh, prior residents of the camps, meaning the Baltic people, the Ukrainians, uh, the Polish uh, people, uh, Romanians, Hungarians. It is half forgotten fact that uh, uh, almost 15 million people in Europe were out of their home countries by the end of World War II. This included former political, um, former forced laborers returning from Germany, uh, expelled German minorities from Eastern Europe and the Balkan countries, um, and um, above all, people escaping from Stalin and from communist regimes, or refusing repatriation back behind the Iron Curtain. Therefore, the International Refugee Organization and um, other humanitarian organizations and uh, refugee funds faced an enormous task. Uh, the displaced person camps were meant to host only one nationality. For example, there were separate Latvian camps, separate Polish camps, uh, separate Ukrainian camps. But in most cases, uh, many nationalities uh, were living together. And also the Czechs and the Slovaks ended up in, in various locations. As you can see, the accommodation for refugees met only very basic requirements. Uh, we are talking about wooden shacks, uh, former prisoner of war camps, uh, military barracks, uh, schools, um, factories, or even more primitive uh, uh, housing, such as tents or train cars. Um, we also need to, to understand or, or remember that the atmosphere in these camps was ex extremely tense in late 1940s because there was a widespread belief that um, the you know, beginning of the Cold War would uh, quickly change into an armed conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. But you know, time passed, uh, people remained long um, weeks or even months uh, in the camps, they were sending visa applications and desperately waiting uh, for work permits and transports uh, to new homes 
Um, we also need to understand that Western Europe uh, still uh, lay in ruins. The economy was painfully slow in recovering uh, from uh, the war. Um, production at factories stalled and unemployment was very high. Uh, French politics, for example, was um, convulsed by permanent constitutional crisis. And suddenly these same countries, France, Netherlands, Belgium, even Great Britain, uh, were to be hit by a massive influx of immigrants from somewhere from the East. Logically, uh, these countries were not prepared for that and um, the people uh, did not hide their, their fears. So refugees rather looked beyond the boundaries of Europe. A dream destination number one was the United States, of course, but um, the American immigrant quotas were very strict. So more and more people were uh, going to Latin America, to Australia, to New Zealand. Um, these countries were looking for fresh blood and experts in wide range of uh, disciplines. Uh, medical doctors, engineers, craftsmen, these people, these professions had open doors to, um, uh, to uh, South Africa, to Canada. Um, in my opinion, life in these displaced person camps deserves much further uh, research because I would liken it to a unique microcosm uh, where you could have found, I don't know, black market, uh, prostitution, violent and boozy clashes, um, as well as churches, chapels, uh, libraries, schools, kindergartens. Uh, you know, to, to make the story short, the, the life of the Czechs and Slovaks, but also the Ukrainians and, and the Poles and Hungarians, into DP camps is a, is a very interesting topic and I actually published a, a book about it a few years ago. Uh, and now with the, the current situation uh, in Ukraine and with the ongoing war, I can see some similarities. You know, I, I can see that uh, there are some patterns. Uh, what was already seen back then in 1940s, 1950s, we can see now again. So it's, it's very tragic that we are, you know, we are back. Uh, in the uh, displaced person camps, also the first magazines, brochures, and leaflets were published, and the first seeds of uh, political activity um, were, were born. <clears throat> now, while doing um, this research on the Czechoslovak exile and its developments and on Czechoslovak refugees, I began to think in a broader <laughs> way uh, about the Cold War emigres from all the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. And I began to question <clears throat> how the Czechoslovak experience was unique and specific uh, in comparison to the Polish, Hungarian, Bulgarian, and, or, or Baltic um, emigres. Uh, <clears throat> political emigration has played a prominent role in the modern history of all the countries uh, in this region. Um, after, after the Yalta Conference in 1945, um, a large number of political emigres who had already experienced communist rule uh, were convinced that the Yalta agreements uh, were not um, conducive to an independent and democratic existence uh, for the Eastern European countries. So they rather decided to remain in the West and did not return uh, to their homelands after the liberation from the Nazis and, you know, desperately watched uh, the irreversible Sovietization from afar. The communists, backed by Moscow, took power in Albania, Romania and Bulgaria in 1945. Uh, Hungary and Poland uh, followed soon after, and <coughs> Czechoslovakia fell as the very last uh, limited pluralist democracy in February 48. And former democratic politicians, diplomats, high government um, and military officials as well as journalists and academics uh, simply did not hesitate for long to flee abroad and uh, to start another struggle for freedom and democracy in, <clears throat> in exile. Uh, at first they settled in Paris and London, but soon after the headquarters of the exile activities moved overseas to New York and Washington. <clears throat> uh, speaking of the Czechs, uh, for some of the uh, leaders of the post-February or anti-communist exile, it was already the, their the third exile in their life. Can you imagine that? They were anti-Austrian uh, resistance fighters. Uh, they tried to gain independence for Czech nation, uh, to destroy the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So that was the first time when they left and they, they stayed uh, in Western Europe or in the United States. Um, they achieved the, the main goal. The, the Czechoslovak Republic was established in 1918. 
so they were fine, they were living in, in Czechoslovakia, then they had to leave again in 1939 because of, of the Nazi occupation. They stayed six years uh, in exile during the war, they came back in 1945, and yet in 1948, only three years later, they had to escape again for the third time in, in three decades or in four decades. So uh, it was very tragic for, for many of them and um, of course uh, they didn't uh, live long enough to, to see the fall of the Iron Curtain because it lasted simply um, for too long, for four decades. Now, <clears throat> let's move to the United States. In uh, December 1947, the newly formed National Security Council warned that the Soviet Union was um, conducting an intensive uh, propaganda campaign directed um, primarily against the United States, employing coordinated psychological, political and economic measures designed to undermine the non-communist <coughs> elements in Europe and elsewhere. And the only responsible available to weaken and roll back this communist influence was to initiate a psychological offensive in return. The director of the policy planning staff at the State Department, George Forskenen, um, presented the document Inauguration of Organized Political Warfare at the National Security Council meeting on May the 4th, 1948, in the presence of um, uh, President Harris Truman. Kennan highlighted um, the importance of providing assistance for liberation committees, underground activities behind the Iron Curtain, uh, and the support of anti-communist elements in um, uh, threatened countries of the free, free world. Uh, we can say that in late 1940s, um, the situation in uh, Central and Eastern Europe was already clear. You know, communists uh, got power in all these countries. But we have to remember that also in Italy or France, the communist parties were very strong, very influential. And um, it could have also happened that uh, they would win uh, there as well. So there was still a, uh, a threat <coughs> uh, to, to democracy and to de democratic development of, of these countries as well. So, um, uh, Kennan uh, proposed various um, covered activities behind the Iron Curtain, various information campaigns, uh, launching of new propaganda channels, and uniting of uh, political emigres through a, a common organizational platform. And uh, these were the beginnings of the organization called the National Committee for Free Europe. The founders of uh, this new organization were initially not totally certain of its uh, exact purpose and functions. They knew that the National Committee would not provide humanitarian aid to refugees from Eastern Europe or to help with applications for US visas uh, for those still interned in the refugee camps. Instead, it would focus on a chosen group of non-fascist and non-communist political leaders who had successfully made it to the United States to find appropriate employment and make use of their knowledge and abilities during the, their stay in America. The committee's articles of association were signed in New York City on May the 17th, 1949. You can see them here. Uh, at the first press conference, uh, this four-point program was introduced. And through the founding of the National Committee for Free Europe, the politi political, organizational and operational groundwork uh, for all forms of anti-Soviet and anti-communist propaganda uh, was in place. The financial aid uh, for uh, the activities of the National Council was assured as well. Donations officially came uh, from uh, private uh, donors and large corporations such as Chevrolet or Ford Motor Company, General Electric, Chase National Bank, <clears throat> but above all was the behind the scenes support from the Department of State and from the CIA. So now we can say after those 70 years that the National Committee for Free Europe was a CIA uh, project. Uh, and uh, uh, so with with the with the foundation of the of the uh, National Committee for Free Europe the whole scale of uh, anti-communist uh, activities um, uh, began. Uh, 
In subsequent years, many common projects unifying the exiles uh, came to life under the supervision of the National Committee. Uh, for example, there was this information uh, campaign called Crusade for Freedom, warning the American public uh, about the communist menace. There was the Free Europe College, uh, providing university education to talented students among the Eastern European emigres. There was the publication of uh, the monthly journal called uh, News from Behind the Iron Curtain, and of course the broadcasting of the Radio Free Europe. And all this was devised and funded by the National Committee for Free Europe, and in all these, uh, the leaders of exile communities uh, participated as editors, lecturers, analysts, etc. These, uh, we can say, coordination efforts also uh, resulted in the creation of the Assembly of Captive European Nations in New York City, which officially saw the light of day on September 20th, 1954, as a non-incorporated uh, non-profit company. Uh, the Assembly, or ASEN, uh, was intended to act as a shadow counterbalance to the United Nations. Um, it was meant to coordinate the, the management of anti-communist, anti-Soviet campaigns to publicize news from behind the Iron Curtain and to generate uh, international support for the liberation of um, Soviet-ruled parts of Europe. The structure of the Assembly generally followed the structure of the United Nations. It uh, consisted of a General Assembly, General Committees and several Working Committees. And the General Sessions were held uh, once a year, usually in September. And these functioned as uh, uh, the sanctioning assemblies uh, through which various re resolutions were announced and the members of the General Committee were elected. Uh, also, lectures and situational reports on developments in individual countries behind the Iron Curtain were presented and uh, voting on uh, resolutions and protests uh, took place uh, at these sessions as well. Uh, the sessions took place in New York City to coincide with the United Nations uh, General Assembly sessions and were frequently also coordinated with uh, public demonstrations um, to raise their profile and uh, increase the volume of their message. Uh, between 1956 and 1963, the assembly rented a two-story building owned by the Carnegie Endowment on the First Avenue in Manhattan, directly opposite the United Nations uh, headquarters. So the United Nations delegates from the communist countries uh, simply could not avoid the unpleasant view of, of posters and billboards hanging just across the street that alerted the passers-by on uh, to the ongoing Red Terror and Soviet imperialism. <clears throat> the democratic, non-communist, liberal politicians um, had made the United States uh, the focus of their liberation efforts in the uh, late 1940s and um, the organizations and projects uh, I mentioned uh, did not aspire to determine the future, the future political and economic structure for their countries, but aimed uh, to bring about a situation wherein their people would be able to decide without any foreign interference the form of government they wanted to live under. Naturally, there were different views and uh, disagreements about uh, what would constitute uh, an effective liberation. The conservative and, we can say, extremist um, part of the exile community claimed that only a complete eradication of communism would assure it. The majority, however, said that many of the economic and uh, the social changes introduced by the communists would have to stay because they had become uh, part of each nation's life. But they demanded uh, free elections, of course, as the most important condition. And some emigre politicians even uh, began to argue that um, liberation might well come from a gradual democratization of the communist regimes. Hopes for the liberation, uh, even with the risk of an armed conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, uh, ran highest probably in 1951-52, uh, even during the, the presidential election between Dwight Eisenhower and, and Adlai Stevenson. Uh, when there was really much talk about, about the liberation. The votes from American Czechs, Poles, Hungarians, etc. Uh, sent the Republican candidates to the White House, to the White House because they expected that um, General Eisenhower, who had experience from Europe, he was there in 1945, he knew what the Soviet troops were doing in Eastern Europe, uh, 
uh, that he would take a, a tough stance against the Soviets. After the death of Joseph Stalin in March 1953, actually we are celebrating now, right? He died on March the 5th, I guess. Uh, it seemed to be that opportunities for change in uh, particular countries of the Soviet bloc would open up. The first attempts uh, were seen in the uh, German Democratic Republic, meaning in Eastern Germany, where in June 1953 uh, there were serious social protests which involved about uh, 400,000 people in over 200 cities, um, uh, even um, including East Berlin. Uh, but these protests um, were pacified very quickly as a result of the Soviet military intervention. So this was the first serious blow to the hopes and expectations of the emigres. The other one was the Geneva, Geneva summit of uh, July 1955, where the representatives of the Soviet Union, United States, France and Great Britain met for the very first time in a decade uh, following the end of the war. And before this, this conference or this summit, uh, the Western leaders were swamped um, uh, with telegrams and resolutions from various exiled communities demanding that the problem of li liberation uh, be to be put on the agenda. Although President Eisenhower seemed to be open to the suggestion, the issue of the liberation of Eastern Europe was not raised in Geneva. Moreover, the summit was um, followed by a period of dis disappointments uh, when, for example, communist Albania, Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania were admitted to the United Nations and then uh, the, the West um, failed to intervene uh, effectively in the Polish and Hungarian uprisings uh, in 1956. And that even raised the question whether there was a room for political emigres or political exiles and their activities in the world uh, where conflicting systems tolerated one another. Uh, besides uh, speaking about speaking of Czechoslovakia, uh, another tragedy appeared in 1968, uh, as you know, 20 years later. Uh, on August 21st, uh, five armies of the, Sovi uh, of the Warsaw Pact, uh, led by the Soviet army, occupied Czechoslovakia to crack down on reformist trends of the leadership in Prague. What happened exactly? <clears throat> in early 1968, a conservative communist leader uh, and president Antony Novotny was ousted as the head of uh, the Communist Party, and he was replaced by a younger progressivist leader, um, Slovak politician Alexander Dubček. Uh, his government um, uh, ended censorship in uh, March 1968 and uh, the acquisition of this freedom resulted in a public um, expression of uh, broad-based support for reforms and uh, a public sphere uh, in which government and party policies could be debated openly. In April, the Czechoslovak government issued a formal plan for further reforms, although it tried to uh, liberalize um, within the existing framework of the Marxist-Leninist state and did not propose any revolutionary overhaul of the political and economical systems. And this whole liberalization process was called the Prague Spring. Uh, Soviet leaders were deeply concerned over these recent <coughs> developments in Czechoslovakia, naturally, uh, recalling the 1956 um, uprising in Hungary, uh, Kremlin simply worried that uh, if Czechoslovakia carried reforms too far, other satellite countries um, in Eastern Europe might follow and that it might lead um, to a widespread rebellion uh, against uh, Moscow's leadership. Uh, and after much debate, <coughs> Uh, the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, um, led by Leonid Brezhnev, decided to intervene uh, to establish uh, a more conservative and pro-Soviet government in, in Prague. Uh, here is a funny poster. Um, uh, what are they doing? They are looking for country revolution. Of course, there was no attempt you know, to, to leave this, uh, the Warsaw Pact or uh, to leave the Soviet bloc, but um, it was still uh, too dangerous for uh, for uh, Kremlin and for Brezhnev. Um, when the occupation forces invaded, uh, they uh, swiftly took control of Prague and other major cities and communication and transportation links. And given the escalation US involvement in the conflict in Vietnam, 
uh, as well as uh, past uh, U.S. pronouncements on uh, non-intervention in the East Bloc, uh, the Soviets guessed correctly that America and the free world would condemn the invasion but refrain uh, from intervening. Uh, although the Soviet crackdown uh, of Czechoslovakia was swift and successful, uh, small-scale resistance uh, continued uh, throughout early 1969, uh, while the Soviets struggled to install a stable, obedient government. And finally, in April 1969, um, the Soviets uh, forced Dubček and the rest of the reformist wing of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia uh, from power in favor of a more conservative um, administrators. And in the years that followed, uh, the new leadership re-established government censorship and controls preventing freedom and, and movement. And the invasion of August 68 also caused another massive wave of uh, migration. Uh, this time, the, the Western European governments uh, benevolently extended uh, tourist visas to Czechoslovak citizens who already were abroad, because, you know, August, um, uh, that was the end of the summer, so many people were already uh, in, in Italy or in Yugoslavia because it was allowed to travel, so they, they were on vacation, <coughs> and they simply, after they, they uh, learned what happened in, in Czechoslovakia, they decided to, to stay and um, not to come back to, uh, to Czechoslovakia. Uh, so the Western European countries uh, positively processed applications uh, for political asylum to tens of thousands of, of people. Uh, and the kind of level of sympathy um, of the free world could not be compared to the period after 1948 when uh, people often you know, fled to save their lives without any property and after overcoming the Iron Curtain, uh, uh, months of uncertainty and hardship awaited them in the refugee camps. This time, the Czechs and the Slovaks were considered the victims of the Soviet aggression and were you know, granted uh, asylum. Uh, and sometimes, again, I can see some similarities with the current situation in, in Ukraine. Uh, after the invasion, the Czech Czechoslovak borders remained open for quite some time and those who owned the passport uh, had a chance to, to slip out uh, for, for a few months. Uh, again, official state security data for the years 1968 and 1969 uh, reported some 70,000 uh, people and uh, for the entire period between 1968 and um, uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain in November 1989, we are talking about uh, 130,000 people who, <coughs> who left the, the country. Uh, the motivation to flee was, was obvious, it was the fear of the consequences of the occupation, political oppression and of course uh, um, the desire for a better living. Two-thirds of the emigres um, were of working age, mostly between 20 and uh, 30 years of age and 40% of them, that's interesting, represented workers' professions. So even the workers wanted to leave the workers' paradise. Uh, uh, as I said, as victims of the Soviet terror, these, we call them 68ers, uh, they had a relatively good chance of settling in, uh, in Western Europe, uh, even the countries like Switzerland, uh, Sweden or Netherlands, which uh, were almost uh, closed and isolated for the uh, refugees after 1948, uh, this time showed uh, very, very friendly and open welcoming policy and processed um, the visa uh, or immigration visas within just a few weeks or even days. Uh, but in the meantime, the people had to wait in, in the refugee camps again. Uh, the largest one was the camp uh, Treiskirchen near Vienna in Austria. We can see another picture. So uh, as a conclusion, we can say that uh, both emigre generations, both exile generations after 1948 and after 1968, had to go through a complicated bureaucratic processes before they were accepted by Western countries and could have resettled and started a new life. But as educated, hardworking and adaptable people, they successfully integrated at the end. The Cold War and the communist supremacy over the Eastern European region lasted for more than four decades and the majority of the, of the fighters for freedom and democracy didn't uh, live um, to see the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, 
in the fall of 1989. Therefore, we historians need to catalog their efforts and make sure that their work will not be forgotten. Thank you very much.